This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. I think we're on page 67, aren't we? Just to start, page 67. The roles and the duties of a promoter. Then it's pretty much common sense, quite frankly, but unless I tell you, then it may be difficult for you to work it out for yourselves. They act under instruction. Somebody asks them, will you form a company for me? So they act under instruction in order to form and create a company. And this involves blah, 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 finding people who will sign the memorandum and the articles and therefore also act as the company's first directors. Select a suitable name. Name and the choice of name can be awkward. Um, financial training, when they were creating their company, way, way back in time, there's a form that you fill in when you're registering the company and your choice of name. There are three lines for you to fill in your selected ideal name. And they put in things like FT and, and FinTrain, and they submitted the forms to the registrar, and the registrar rejected them and said, no, you can't have these. These names are too similar to existing companies. So they submitted. They then sent back to financial training the people creating the company. They sent them a new form with ten possible choices of name, and they filled in the ten and submitted them, and the registrar said, no, you can't have those either. So they sent another form of ten, and you can't have those. But with that... The registrar returned and said, why not call yourselves financial training? And they said, oh, that's a good name. So it's actually the registrar that selected the name financial training. So the choice of name is not a straightforward thing. There are people who create companies just with the intention of selling them, so they create a company not acting under instruction, promoters, and they create and they have a stock of companies, an inventory of companies ready for sale. And they have, I think, they must have, uh, two lists of monosyllable words. And then they just take one word from there and one word from there and put them together. So black hawk or green pin and, and, and just select these two monosyllables to create companies. And if it's not important what the name of the company is, if, you, if you're not going to use the name to identify the business that you're in, then it doesn't matter, does it? It could be any old name. Not quite any old name, but uh, we'll come to the restrictions on the choice of name in a minute or two. So the name of the company will normally be selected by the promoter unless the person giving the promoter instruction says, I want a company to be formed and I want it to have such and such a name. Determine the form and the amount of the company's share capital. Yeah, that's fine, except there used to be, and there no longer is, the requirement of identifying what the maximum authorized capital should be. Now, if it was going to be a big company, or if it's a small company which intends to grow big, it would normally be the case that you would maybe put the share capital, the authorized share capital, maybe a million pounds, but then if you did need to increase it later, because, for instance, it was the National Telephone Company and, and they wanted to sell lots of shares to lots of potential shareholders, then they would subsequently have to increase it. And, of course, that's a pain. It's, it's an, 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 ex, an, an additional extra piece of effort that you're going to have to put in. So if you've got plans to become a big company, then you may as well establish yourself with £100 million pounds worth of share capital. This was important way back in history, because way back in history, one of the ways in which the government raised money was to tax the authorized share capital. So when you created a company with an authorized share capital of a million, there was a tax at a particular rate uh, applied to that authorized capital. And then, of course, every time you increase it, again, you have to pay the tax. That tax has now disappeared. It used to be called stamp duty. That's gone, so it's no longer relevant to worry about what should be your authorised capital. But with effect from the 2006 Act, 
it's no longer necessary, in fact it's not required at all, to have an authorised share capital. There is no need for an authorised maximum. So your constitution no longer needs to specify this is the authorised maximum of share capital. But that's only with effect from 2006. So existing companies which did exist before 2006 still have this limitation within their constitution that this is the maximum share capital that they can issue. But it's no longer a requirement. Promoters determine the form and the amount of the company's share capital, but it's no longer particularly important. Determine the rights to be attached to the different classes of shares. Share capital, in its simplest form, uh, would be, in, in this part of the world, we call it equity shares. In the UK, we call them ordinary shares. So ordinary shares is the equivalent of your equity shares. And equity shares, therefore, are created and then sold to the shareholders and that is the basis of their voting rights and the basis of their dividend receivable rights. But it may be that we want different classes of share. So for instance we can have a class of share called a preference share and the name itself tells you that this share carries preferential entitlements when compared with the ordinary shares. So for instance if there is only enough money to pay either the preference dividend or the ordinary dividend, then the preference dividend will be paid. In a liquidation, the preference shareholder will be paid their capital before the ordinary shareholders get their capital. And you'll have to pay off the preference shareholders in full before you start thinking about paying anything to the equity or the ordinary shareholders. So it is possible to have equity shares and preference shares. Why would anyone want buy a preference share if they have these preferential rights? Well, because preference shares don't normally have voting power. So if you want to take part in votes at a general meeting, uh, then you should have equity shares or ordinary shares. If you're not bothered about voting, then preference shares would possibly be better, arguably would be better. In other classes, I formed a company once with four different classes of share. We had the ordinary shares, and then we had the A ordinary share, just one, and the B ordinary share, and the C ordinary share. And these three extra ones were for the wives of the three men who were creating the company. And we had that so that one wife didn't work at all, another one worked part-time, and another one had a very good job. So we could then discriminate with reference to the dividend payments in order to equalize the aggregate amount taken out tax advantageously by the, the three separate families. You can have founder shares or management shares or uh, non-participating extra shares. You can describe the shares in any way you want. There's no limit to the descriptions that you could apply to the shares. Each of these shares, classes, will have different rights. They're called class rights. And the class rights attached to the shares will be determined by the promoter on creation of the company. The class rights then determine the way in which the company should operate with reference to that class of shareholder. And you may choose later to vary those class rights. You may choose to amend them or uh, alter them in some way and so you'd have to have a class meeting and the meeting would be held for the members of the B ordinary shares and they would meet and the directors would say we want to vary your class rights and this is how we want to vary them and 75 percent typically 75 percent of the members of that class must vote in favor of such an amendment so classes of shares can be important, but I suggest that most companies will only have one class of share. They will just have ordinary shares. Just while I'm talking about the shares, and it's a little bit preemptive of what we're going to be looking at maybe later today about the share capital, shares typically will have a face value of one pound, but they don't have to have. They could have a face value of 50 pence or 25 pence or 10 pence or 1 pence, anything you want, 42 pence. You could have any nominal or face value of the shares. 
And that face value of the shares then is the, um, the base point upon which the rest of the activity is then uh, based. So if we want to issue shares, these 50 pence shares, there is a minimum price for which I can sell them. I can sell them for £1.20 or £1.10 or 80 pence, but I cannot sell these shares for less than 50 pence. If I sell them for more than their face value, then you're going to pay me 90 pence for a 50 pence share. The double entry is debit cash 90, credit share capital 50, and credit share premium 40. Now that share premium account cannot be used to finance a dividend. I can't take money out, say credit cash, and debit the share premium account. I can only debit what are called distributable profits. And a share premium account is not a distributable reserve. It's a, a statutory non-distributable reserve. So share premium account represents the excess value that the company receives on the event that the company issues shares to shareholders. Okay. They prepare, coming back to the notes, the page 67, the uh, promoter prepares the constitution. What's involved in the constitution? It's not the memorandum. It used to be, but it's no longer. Articles. It's just the articles, any resolutions which affect the articles, any agreements which affect the articles. It's just the articles. It used to be the case until 2006 that the Constitution was the two documents, the Memorandum of Association and the Articles of Association. But with effect from 2006, this has now changed. The Constitution is just the articles and any amendments or agreements to those articles. Having done all this and completed the forms, the promoter will then send all the necessary forms to the registrar and will pay the preliminary and formation expenses of the company, which the promoter would then hope to get back from the company. The company hopefully will reimburse the promoter. So when the promoter sells the company, included within the sale, the promoter will identify on his own invoice the fact that preliminary and formation expenses of so much have been paid on behalf of the company. Duties... Is a duty is basically in common law the, uh, to act with reasonable skill and care. Tell me what you understand by the expression a reasonable skill and care. Gunute? It's skill and care which is reasonable, yeah. It's skill and care which you may reasonably expect from a person of that age, experience and qualification. And if it's not a person who's experienced through age or through practice, and if they don't have qualifications, then you can't expect a such degree of skill and care as you might expect, for instance, from me, rather older and qualified and experienced. So if you were to form a company, the extent of the skill and care expected from you would be rather less than the degree of skill and care expected from me. Who decides reasonable? Court. Yeah, the court, ultimately, the court is the one that says, well, you, you didn't act particularly very skillfully nor carefully, but on the other hand, you're not very old and you're not very experienced and, uh, and you don't have any qualification, so we can't expect any great degree of skill and care from you. I don't mean that nastily, I'm not ridiculing you. Another duty is to disclose any profit or potential conflict of interest, either to the first independent board of directors, or to the company's existing or intended shareholders. And there's a, a case of Erlanger and the new Sombrero Phosphate Mining Company. Baron Erlanger, Baron is a sort of lord, Baron Erlanger and his friends created a company and the idea was that they were going to buy an island in the Caribbean. And this island was not inhabited, it was full of bird shit. Just deep, I mean really deep. And bird shit is full of phosphates of lime. 
and they were going to buy the island and then excavate and take all this phosphate of lime and use it as a fertilizer because it's good for land. So they bought the island for £55,000, a long time ago, it's a lot of money, £55,000. They created the company and sold the land, the island, for £110,000. They doubled their money. He and his friends had formed the company. They were the first directors. He told these other friends of his exactly what he had done. He'd bought it for fifty-five, we we'd sold it for a hundred and ten. Uh, me and my friends have therefore made a profit. Now, let's sell this company, let's sell the company to the people who want to do the digging and the mining of the phosphates. They didn't tell them. They didn't tell the first independent board of directors. They told the first directors, which was themselves. But they didn't tell the first independent board of directors. And the independent board of directors discovered that this 55,000 profit had been made and they turned back to Baron Erlanger and his friends and said, you never disclose this to us. Erlanger said he didn't need to, it was not a requirement. He had disclosed it to the first directors, him and his friends. And the court said no, the disclosure should have been made to the first independent board of directors. So he had to pay all the 55,000 back, all the profit back into the company. So there's a duty of disclosure which allows the company to rescind the contract and recover the purchase price, or in that case, recover the profit. The company may require the promoter to pay over to the company any undisclosed profits. I'm not going to go through either Gluckstein Barnes nor Whaley Bridge and Green. You can look those up. The company may sue the promoter and claim damages for breach of fiduciary duty. A fiduciary duty is a duty of good faith. It comes from the Latin word fides, which means faith. And if you look on the back of a, an English coin, if you look on the back of an English coin, it says um, FD. It's an abbreviation, it says Elizabeth R. It used to say Indimp, the Empress of India, but that's no longer on coins. But it does say FD, and it's the abbreviation for Fidelis Defensus, the Defender of the Faith. So the Queen is the Defender of the Faith. I presume the Faith there is the um, Christian Faith. I don't know. But Fidelis and Fides and Fiducery are all from the same root, and it means a duty of good faith. So we have here promoters who are bound by a duty of good faith not to make secret profits. They're allowed to make profits, but not secret profits. Any profit that they make should be disclosed. And if they disclose it, that's fine. If Erlanger had said to these first independent board of directors, this island that you're buying, we were very lucky. We bought it for 55000 and we sold it privately, we bought it for 55, we sold it to the company for 110, we've made a super profit. And if he'd said that to the directors, the directors would then have had no claim against him. But he didn't tell them, and so they were able to recover that non-disclosed profit. Duties of good faith are to act with reasonable skill and care, not to benefit from your position without making disclosure, and not therefore to make secret profits. Over the page onto 68, still on formation, the application for registration uh, must contain this information. It must contain the proposed name of the company. It can be, it can be whatever you want, but there are exceptions, there are limitations on the choice of name. They're not desperately wide limitations. But there are some limitations on the uh, choice of name that you can select. The registered office. When it says the registered office, it means the, uh, it would say in the Constitution, the registered office of the company is to be situated in England and, not England or, England and Wales. Wales being a separate country which is attached to England, but the registered office will be situated in England and Wales. 
How can he have a registered office in two countries? Well, the answer is because England and Wales combined are a single administrative district. Scotland is its own administrative district. Northern Ireland is its own administrative district. But England and Wales combine, so they're always referred to as England and Wales. The equivalent English or British qualification, particularly British qualification for the ACCA, the English equivalent is the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales. So it's the ICAEW. Uh, and it's the equivalent qualification for ACCC, ACCA. We must also include the postal or the proposed postal address of the registered office. This is a, a, an interesting difference between a company and a human person. A human person doesn't have to have a postal address. A human person can just give up all his worldly goods or her worldly goods and just walk the roads of England and Wales and Scotland just, and sleep in hedges and barns. We don't have to have um, a permanent address. Whereas companies must have. They must have a postal address. And the reason that they must have this registered office, the reason they have it is twofold. First of all, there are some statutory records which must be kept by a company and some of them must be kept at the company's registered office. And therefore they have to have a registered office. The alternative or the other reason why they have to have a permanent place is if you want to serve notice on them, if you want to issue them with a summons or you want your solicitor to say we are suing you there has to be an address for the people what about people who live on boats it's not a permanent situation they can move around they can either go up and down the canals or they can sail across to France or if you want to serve notice on a boat owner this has never been asked in F4 no, it just doesn't come up if you want to serve notice on a boat owner then you must put your notice, you, you attach your notice to the mast of the boat. Uh, so you fasten it to the mast and then when they come back to the boat from their shopping or their drinking trip, they see this notice has been served upon them. But that, as I say, that's never been asked, it's just dinner party conversation. Uh, oh, interesting. In Bristol, which is southwest of England, in Bristol, if you're going to claim social security, if because you're homeless and the society looks after the homeless, certainly in the UK, the society looks after the homeless, in order to be able to claim social security, you have to have an address. But of course the homeless people don't have an address. So in Bristol, and maybe now in other parts of the country, the social security organization, the offices in Bristol, have identified that a particular bench in a park with its own postcode should be the address of the homeless people. Well, are about 400 homeless people living on this bench in the park so that they have a permanent address and they can therefore claim their social security. But again, it's never been asked, it's never come. In which city in England is there a bench with 400 people living on it? Two marks, Bristol. It, it won't be asked. Squad Say? Squad I'm missing, I'm sorry. Squad, squatters. squatters, yes, squatters moving onto your bench. <laughs> we don't want any squatters on our bench. We have 400 of us here and we don't want any more. Limitation of members' liability. Are we going to limit the members' liability by shares or by guarantee? This will be identified within the Constitution and within the application for registration. And whether the company is going to be a public company or a private company should be stated on this application form, application for registration. And all these documents are sent in together with, if necessary, a certified translation. If any of this is not in English... Could it be in Bulgarian? Could it be in Russian? Could it? Well, actually, it can. It can be, so long as it's a certified translation. I don't think that was what the intention was. I think the intention was that if, the, if all this detail were written in Welsh, then there has to be a certified translation into English. 
because Welsh, and also there's a language down in the deep, deep southwest of England. It's a language which is rarely spoken, and it's Cornish. The, corn, the people in the bottom left-hand corner of, of England have their own language. They very rarely speak it. Oh, sorry, there are not many people who do speak it, and so it's a dying language, but there is a language down there. And again, that's never been asked. What's the Cornish word for something? Or it's not going to happen. So if everything is in order, the registrar then issues a certificate of incorporation. It's the birth certificate. It's the certificate which confirms that the company has now been created. And the date on the certificate is conclusive proof that that was the date that the company was born. Let me say it again. It is conclusive proof. It is not arguable. If the date is wrong, it's still that date which proves the date of birth of the company. The famous case, Jubilee, Cotton, Mills and Lewis. And you know with old date stamps, you used to have to turn a little wheel round every day. You know, so it was no longer the uh, 1st of April, you had to turn it round, it became the 2nd of April. And then you changed April into May on the 1st of May. And each year you'd then turn the year one little notch round. You remember those, those date stamps, don't you? When Jubilee, Cotton, Mills and Lewis... Normally, at the end of the year, when you're moving from 1897 to 1898, you just move that one round. And in this particular case, it was 1888, goes to 1889, and then in the next year, they moved that one round to zero. And the registrar just moved that... So they registered a company with effect from the date 1880. Even though it was 1st of January 1890, the certificate said 1st of January 1880. And suddenly, you've got to turn your old company, now celebrating our 10th glorious year. And that was the date that the company was formed. No argument. It was formed 10 years ago today. There's no argument. It doesn't nowadays happen. It was just Jubilee, Cotton, Mills and Lewis. So far as I'm aware, it was the only situation when it did happen. But it's an interesting point. And it has come up in an exam question. That has come up that the registrar issues the wrong, a certificate showing the wrong date. And some contracts had been entered into before the company was really incorporated. But then when the certificate of incorporation came through, it was a 10-year-old company, and therefore what was a pre-incorporation contract suddenly became a contract entered into after the company was created according to the certificate. Whoa, what a complicated thing that is. What a, an awkward situation. Again? No, the court can't rectify, or the court can't make correct... Um, the, the, the wrongness. No, the, the act says this is the date. The date on the certificate is the date the company was formed. Well, I understand what you're saying about rectification. I don't think equity law particularly applies to companies. I'm not sure, but the court, no, the court doesn't. How do you interpret a statute? I mean, you may say absurdity, but to interpret it like, like the words actually say might lead to an absurdity. But Case Jubilee can't, Mills, no, they didn't. They just said, that's the date, that, it says there, the date of incorporation, that's the date the company was created. <laughs>